Hey guys, so for this video I thought we could do something uh, slightly different uh, than our usual uh, and that is actually build a small uh, computer. Uh, when I say computer, it's going to be a very, very simple a single processor and uh, a few uh, output lines with LEDs and that kind of stuff. But we'll need a few items and it'll, it'll, uh, like a clock and it'll help us understand more or less how a processor works. So we're going to build this around uh, this guy, the uh, Z80. Um, <clears throat> I have a few of these. This is Zilog one, this is an NEC one, but they're all Z80. Uh, processors and uh, and uh, this is a 20 pin well sorry 40 20 on each side pin chip it's used in many many uh, retro computers like the MSX obviously and the, uh, the I think the Amstrad had one the uh, Sega Master System the Genesis had one to uh, to manage the sound I think and uh, a lot of arcade boards like Galaga um, I'm not sure if Pac-Man had one, but I know the Double Dragon had one. Um, my old, uh, my old Kung Fu Master had one. So it's used in many, many, many uh, systems and arcade boards and, and uh, computers and appliances as well. Uh, but anyway, so uh, this is a 20, uh, sorry, 40 pin chip. Uh, there's eight um, data bus just to carry the data out and for process, well, out to uh, to the uh, the RAMs and in the uh, the processor for processing. Uh, there is uh, uh, 16 uh, address buses. Uh, these are uh, outgoing, outgoing buses, uh, and this is just to address the uh, the ROMs, stuff like that, and the RAMs. And we're not going to worry about these yet at this point, not in this video anyway. Uh, and then there's a few uh, things like the, uh, well, obviously plus five and ground and the clock just to uh, power the. Uh, the uh, CPU, um, we got some bus controls, bus request, which is a request sent, uh, and then the acknowledgement, which is a, uh, which goes out. We got some CPU control stuff like a uh, halt and wait, just to make the uh, the processor stop for a while. The uh, interrupt, um, uh, which is for you know peripherals, it's like joystick controls or anything that you know is peripheral. Uh, non masking interrupts. Uh, we got a reset line. And then the system control ones are essentially the M1, which is the uh, just the cycle. It indicates that the uh, CPU is cycling, is going to uh, its own cycle. We got memory requests, input output uh, request, uh, read and write signals, which we'll uh, we'll look into as well, and refresh signal. <clears throat> These are all active low, uh, meaning uh, that they're normally they're normally tied high and uh, only when they get low are they activated. This is just to make sure that there is a, an explicit high, which is one, so they must be on all the time, unless they're off at which one they activate. So let's uh, let's start already. So we're gonna use um, this breadboard here. Uh, I've already done some uh, small work to it, so I have my um, ground and plus five coming, and then I've tied all these already uh, together. So normally these are essentially just four separate. Uh, breadboards but here I have them uh, tied so the plus five for instance is tied to here which is goes down is tied to here and then uh, it also uh, goes down here so all, I can access plus five, five from any of these and similarly I can access ground from any of these It'll make things much much easier um, otherwise you can actually treat them as four separate uh, breadboards. You get smaller ones that size as well. Uh, I already have a small circuit on this, which I won't show you yet. Um, but essentially, let's uh, let's start. So what we need is a Z80. So we place it somewhere handy, convenient. So somewhere in front of us here. Um, there you go. Now we need to power this essentially. So we need uh, plus five, which is on pin, I believe, uh, eleven. So this is our plus five. Uh, 29 so this is 20 so this is 21 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 yeah and tie this to ground there you go before we power anything well we could literally just power it on but there it's not going to do much because first we can't see that it's doing much but the other thing it needs is a clock. Uh, we need to tell it how fast uh, you need to go. 
So usually to do this, you use one of these guys. This is a, a small crystal, and this one is, I think is 27 megahertz, which is way too fast for this guy. Uh, usually they operate between four and seven point whatever something um, when they're overclocked. I don't have a four megahertz, but even that would be way too fast for our purpose. Uh, what we want to do is have LEDs just uh, showing some of the address lines flashing and, uh, and the, uh, on some of the, the um, other uh, lines so uh, we're not going to use a crystal flag would be way too fast for even a four megahertz would be way way too fast so we're going to use the, um, a small chip called a 555 oh you can see my fat fingers but this is a 555 555 uh, trust me so we're going to put this here um uh, actually maybe a bit closer i think that should do nicely yeah, there you go. Uh, this will be our clock. So we can use this. Um, this, sorry, this chip is used in uh, so many different ways, from just a timer to uh, I've seen it used as a, a voltage um, charger, essentially 12 volt battery charger. Uh, what it does is just checks uh, that. Uh, well, we're going to put it in what's called an A stable, uh, A stable uh, oscillator. And what it does is essentially it, uh, it generates a small uh, clock signal on this leg, square wave. It generates a square wave on this uh, this leg here. And uh, this is uh, actually, this is plus, uh, this is, um, sorry. This is ground, this is plus five over there. Um, I, I encourage you to look up the 555 in an A stable. Uh, oscillator circuit. This is the most standard way to use a 555 and it generates a small clock. We use a voltage drop between pins um, pins 7 and 6 and 8. Um, so normally you use two resistors. We're going to use a pot here in this case so we can actually just uh, uh, change the speed of our signal and it checks for a capacitor usually put between leg 1 and 2. Uh, and the, the capacitor charges and when it reaches a certain charge it outputs uh, well it, it starts discharging it stops its charge and you get output a wave and the combination of the resistors and capacitor creates this timing so the capacitor charges discharges charges discharges at a regular interval and it creates a small clock signal so we're going to do this we're going to use um for this we need to tie a couple of lines together first we need to tie uh can we use this we're going to tie pin i think it's pin two and pin six and then uh we need to power this guy as well so there you go that's our ground and there you go that's our um 555 five, five clock powered uh, next thing we need the option is to put two resistors between pins seven and six sorry six and seven and another one between uh, seven and eight this is a, a pot here which is essentially just two resistors put together and depending on how you turn the pot one of the resistor is stronger than the other that's not very stable so i hope it'll actually reach into and then uh, to reach seven these are so handy I, I really really recommend you get yourself a set of jumpers uh, it'll make your life so much easier so this is there you go between and we need a capacitor pin one and pin two with the negative uh, here going to pin one so pin two is positive pin one is negative so now we should have a working uh, a working uh, 555 to check that it's working we're going to connect the uh, we're going to use something similar uh, to this setup it's a small led i pick it a green led connected to a 220 ohm uh, resistor connected to ground now yeah, yeah, assuming everything went well essentially we should have a flashing LED at a regular interval. So we're going to check that. I'm going to power my board. Hopefully, there you go. We have a clock signal. So uh, what the 555 does, it just checks that uh, this is uh, charged to three, I think it's three quarter of the input signal. And when it, it is uh, at that level, it discharges. So it creates that charging and discharging, which is a, 
it then translated into a square wave. What it is is a square wave, it just outputs five or a dozen. Uh, and the output here activates this LED. It's a very, very handy little circuit. You can generate all sorts of stuff. If you connect that to a speaker, you can actually generate a square wave. And if you can, you know, using the pot, you can actually tune it with the right value capacitor. So it's it's a very, very handy, um, uh, very handy uh, 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 way to generate a square wave. And uh, people have actually made all sorts of applications with it. So really cool chip to have. Uh, I have a few in, uh, in, st in stock. Always handy to have. Anyway, um, so what we need to do now is connect uh, this output, which is uh, here somewhere, pin six. So we're gonna take it from one of these uh, holes here and connect that to pin six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. There you go, and our processor should be working. In fact, I can, yeah, it's, it's getting hot. Okay, so we got our um, working Z18 place, so, um, but even if we power it on, we've no way of, uh, of knowing that it's on, because it's not showing us much. So what we need to do is to check, indeed, that it's on. Uh, to do this, we're gonna uh, connect the M1, uh, M1 line, and uh, I think M1 is the machine cycle one, essentially. It's just, it's an indicator that you've uh, started the machine cycle, essentially. Um, that's all it is. So to do this, we're going to do something similar, and the M1 is pin 27, um, and we're going to do something similar, um, uh, which is use an LED uh, and uh, a resistor uh, in uh, in series. Uh, we're just going to invert them here because uh, I just want to make sure that it uh, powers on when it goes uh, low. So. 27, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, that should be here. So there you go, I got my LED in place at uh, pin 27, and uh, if we power it on, there you go. Uh, so the CPU initially does a few things, it stays on for a while, and then it should uh, more or less blink. However, we can't use that as a reliable indication that the processor is doing what it's supposed to do, because we've got a few pins floating here. Um, so pins can be tri-state, they can be at zero, they can be one, or they can be floating, meaning we cannot know what the state is and they might be alternating between one or two, uh, we just don't know. So it's a problem obviously in uh, most components, um, because you have to treat zero as information as well. Zero is also information, it's not the lack of information, it just tells you that it's at zero. The lack of information is floating, and that's never good. So. Uh, there is stuff like the uh, pin 16 and 17, the um, interrupt lines, as well as the uh, the pins uh, 23, 24, and 25, uh, which are the uh, bus uh, request and acknowledge and the wait. We don't want the uh, CPU to wait for anything. Uh, so we're going to tie all these. These are all incoming, so we don't want to make sure that nothing could be uh, coming in and telling the CPU to just stop. and. Uh, all these bus and interrupt uh, lines, that's what they do. They actually stop the CPU to do something else. So we're gonna tie them to high. We're gonna keep them at a constant one. Now we could use a jumper for this and just tie directly to uh, one or plus five in this case, which is one. Uh, however, that's never a good idea. We don't know how much load will be drawn uh, into the uh, into the um, the CPU. So we're gonna use uh, resistors. We're gonna use a few resistors. Uh, now, 1K resistor should be more than enough. However, I didn't have any 1K resistors. So I'm using 2.2Ks, I think. Um, uh, these are these guys, but 1K should be plenty. So we're gonna put them at pin 16, 17, 23, 24, and 25. So there you go, we've tied all our lines, and uh, now what we need to do is well, tell the CPU to do something. Uh, in this case, um, well, in typical scenario, what you have is these guys. You have a ROM sitting somewhere, and you have a RAM sitting somewhere. Yeah. Uh, so we've got our, our data lines actually on each side of that blue uh, power uh, point plug. Uh, so the data lines would, uh, would actually just uh, uh, fetch and, uh, fetch and, uh, and send uh, you know information so the the CPU goes to the address lines and goes to a bus address bus so all the lines connect to either the RAM or ROM uh, or both um, what you have is a latch or you know something that enables one or the other um, so the, the CPU knows which one 
uh, to uh, to access. This is done through a, you know another circuit called the address decoding circuit, and um, that's not important for now. But what's important is that the uh, the CPU cycles through the address, so it goes to address zeros of the ROM, uh, it looks for an instruction, gets the instruction back uh, through the data lines, uh, either processes it here if it needs to be, or sends it to the uh, the the uh, RAM to be processed, and then this is dispatched afterwards uh, for further processing or display or you know whatever you do with it. So <clears throat> in this case, we're not going to use a ROM. We're not going to use a RAM. Um, what we need, however, is something to uh, mimic a uh, RAM. So because the the RAM will be connected what to the address lines and the data lines, um, and from the data line comes the instruction, all the assembly code essentially, your program comes through the data line. So we're, we're going to force a, a, a piece of code uh, by actually just tying stuff to either ground or plus five, um, and and that way we'll actually mimic uh, mimic a piece of code. What um, what assembler is essentially it's a uh, Sometimes you see assembler code, but every every um, every uh, instruction in assembler corresponds to a number, or and that number is actually stored uh, in 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 a table here, and that does an operation like load register A with the value one, for example. So uh, load register A with value X is actually stored here. Uh, so this is a code, I don't know, for sake of argument, called 5A or something like that. But there's a very handy code which is no-op, which is tells the computer to or the CPU to do nothing, and then uh, and then the, the CPU will actually go to the next address, so address zero, do nothing. So the CPU goes to address one, and then do nothing, it goes to address two. So what we're going to do is we're going to send a do nothing instruction called a no-op, which is zero zero, very handy. And the uh, CPU will actually just do what it does normally, which is cycle through the address one by one. So it'll go to address one, address two, address three, address four, address five, etc., etc. So uh, we're going to do just that. So to, we're going to do without this for now. Uh, we might uh, include one of these in a future video. But what we'll do is we'll actually tie all all our uh, data lines to um, to uh, ground. Sorry because what we want is zero. Um, now remember, this is binary, so this is we've got eight data lines, uh, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four here, uh, and to make uh, that zero, we actually need to connect all of these data lines, because if we leave something floating, they might come to one, sometimes they might get to zero some other times. We don't want that, we want to make sure that we send, we actually send a zero in. So we're gonna use these, uh, I think these are 220 again? Not sure, they might be. Um, and uh, that's what I had handy, but I think uh, in, in this case uh, a 120 or a uh, 100 ohm will, uh, will do plenty. So we're going to connect these to our ground, not here. Um, so it's these four, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, and four. So let's do that. So there you go, we've got our uh, uh, eight, uh, uh, 220, I think, can't remember, uh, two, yeah, 220 uh, ohm resistors here on our eight uh, data lines or data bus. Essentially, we're sending zero, 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 zero in binary. So that's, uh, it translates into zero <laughs> and zero, 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 zero. So all zeros, uh, which is no up, as we said. So do nothing, essentially, as far as the computer is concerned. And then it will go on the next address line. So uh, to check that it's indeed doing that, we're going to use another one of these LEDs and uh, essentially just uh, put this on the address line. So um, address zero, um, where did they start? I think there's a few here and a few here. Um, I could be wrong. Uh, let me check the uh, schematics. So yeah, we got uh, one, two, three, four, five, which are actually 11. So these are the last ones. So they start here at pin 30, uh, all the way here to pin 40. And the last one start here. So the, the address line is here. It's kind of awkward, but that's just the uh, configuration we have. So we're gonna tie these uh, to ground. So there you go, we've got uh, one, two, three, four, six LEDs here. I've actually used the one I use for power here uh, because by this stage we know when we have power, the whole board lights up. Um, so what we should be seeing is that as we send the no up, the, uh, the CPU will just go through the address line. So again, to reiterate, that's what a CPU does. It goes to address line, 
zero zero and looks for a line of code here and then it does what that line of code tells it if it tells it to jump your address 15 or 500,000 or whatever it will jump to that uh, and then it will do whatever uh, processing it needs to do there so if there's nothing to do it will jump to the next one or if it's just uh, 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 an assertion there it will do that and then unless it's specific you know specifically told to jump somewhere it will jump to the next line and the next line so what we should be seeing is this is the first address line zero one two three or one two three four five six uh, for convenience and uh, so we should see this one flash first and then this one will flash and then the two will flash because essentially this is binary so this is one this is two and the two together is three this one on its own is is four uh, this one and this one is five this one and this one is six so it's a binary table uh, translated into so we should be this see this iteration jumping from here to here the two lit up together and then we jump here on its own uh, this one and this one and then all three together so that's what we should see though let's plug this in so there you go, um, five, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and so on and so forth. So when all of these are plugged in, it's gonna, it should light up the next one here, which isn't switch on. It looks like they're they're stacking up from from the left, well, from the right into the left. Essentially, that's what's happening. But what we're seeing here is just the binary count of the computer going through all the address lines. What it's doing is it thinks it has a ROM, so it would be essentially going to this ROM here and uh, looking for instructions there. It would send back, the ROM would send back the instruction through the data lines. These are uh, bi-directional, this is one direction, the address line is one direction, it's going, uh, it's going out. This is bi-directional, uh, the data line. So the ROM would send back the uh, inf instruction through the data lines, it would be processed and then uh, and then sent uh, back in this case to ram so um uh, this is the setup essentially that you'd have for a computer more or less i mean uh, all computers are a combination of just a, a processor some uh, some piece of code um maybe some rams not not necessarily always but well, usually and then uh, and then uh, some output or some, uh, something. So, um, what is this circuit used for, ideally? Well, we just made a small computer that essentially does not compute anything. We're just telling it to do nothing. Uh, it's just to observe that um, other things are working. If you want it to be a bit more, maybe, thorough, we could actually connect the read uh, line, which would be pin 21. So, pin 21 is here. So there you go, I've added a green LED here to the uh, read uh, line. Uh, the, there's also a right line here, but I haven't done anything because we're sending no up, so there's actually no right sent to um, anything that would be a pseudo ROM or anything like that. Uh, if we actually uh, send in, uh, if we reconfigure this to send a different uh, instruction that maybe writes uh, data to the uh, not the RAM, sorry, but the RAM that just been seen flying past um, to the RAM, then we'd see uh, this uh, this right LED flash. But I've uh, I've actually added uh, another one here to the uh, memory uh, request um, just for the sake of adding another one to the memory request. Um, and this is should be an orange LED. Uh, again, this is active low, so we have the like the uh, LEDs here, which are standard, but this is active low, so I want it to flash when it goes low, because it should be high all the time. Um, and same with this and this. So anyway, this is pin 19. This one here is pin 21. Uh, so let's see what we have. There you go. I probably should include a reset button as well, just to check that the... Uh, computer resets properly but there you go this is uh, essentially what we've done here so the uh, memory request should be flashing twice per cycle so if we if we look closely one two yeah and this should be slightly behind the uh, the um, m1 this flashes uh, once per four of these 
So there you go. So the last questions, I suppose, is what do you use this for other than you no know, flashing fancy LEDs? Well, in uh, in my board fixes, um, you, you've probably seen a few of them on the channel by now, but uh, sometimes it's hard to tell whether a processor is, is working or not. And uh, when I pull a processor, I keep it, but I have no actual guarantee that it's working properly. It might power on. It might have some indicators that M1 is running, but there's nothing coming out of the address line or the uh, data lines or anything like that. So this is a cool way to do a just a quick generic test. Uh, and for instance, I know that these, because I've tested them before, uh, that these uh, CPUs aren't working. So uh, what would happen if I swap them? So we're gonna disconnect, we're gonna lift this guy. And this one is working, it seems. That's good. Let's try this guy. Yeah, this fella is working too. And we'll try one last one. Some people are probably cringing here that I'm uh, live swapping them while uh, trust me these are fine um, so there you go again and try a quick reset but oh it seems this guy is working as well Oops. yeah no matter how many times I reset yeah the, the CP is fried I mean some of the lines are flashing it's, it's trying to do something but it's just not able to if we try, actually, if we try this, we're gonna use a jumper. So reset should be high all the time, unless we specify that it's low. So I'm gonna use this as a reset pin. And reset, if we look at our uh, chart, is pin 26. And pin 26 should be uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, Actually, this is a tight. There you go. Reset. So I tie I tied this high, but now I send low to it, and it resets. Yeah, this is uh, this is actually working. Um, actually, this is not a bad little uh, method to reset. So uh, let's see if I can dig out uh, a little reset button. So there you go, um, I have this uh, little button here and uh, that should tie in to the reset and actually sh it should force the, uh, the, uh, the uh, it should tie the, um, <laughs> the reset line to zero or to, uh, to ground. So if I press this, there you go, my CPU resets uh, and reinitialized. That's actually a good way to empty your uh, your CPU uh, of uh, anything because it goes through a reinitialization re process. Um, so there you go, this is a little computer, uh, a computer that does nothing but it just shows you exactly, or well, not exactly, but uh, in, in a good introduction to how a Z80 works. What it does, it just reads instruction, it goes to an address, sorry, it reads the instruction and then it does uh, that instruction. If I actually changed this uh, configuration to a different instruction, uh, like, I don't know, load one into a uh, register A, uh, uh, it would uh, it, it would do that and then move on to the next line. If I, uh, if I told it to jump to a certain address, it will also do that and we'll see the jump here operate uh, instead of just having it sequentially. Uh, and then it goes to that address and up in, you know, in, in, in ROM and uh, do the next, next instruction. That's really... Uh, all it does uh, at the beginning. There's also <laughs> a lot of operation and arithmetics it can do and things like that. But I think for now it's a cool introduction to uh, to the Z80. Um, and uh, and as it stands, it uh, it actually uh, operates as a little uh, very very handy little Z80 tester. 
um, we were able to uh, to find out that these uh, these were okay, but this one was indeed bad. Um, so I can throw that away, and I'm I'm sure I can reuse these uh, somewhere. So there you go, guys. Thank you for watching. I hope this was interesting. And uh, we're gonna see how far we can push it. Uh, maybe add a ROM, uh, put a few uh, data instructions. Uh, just random data and get them to fetch and display so what we'll do is uh, we'll use still leds to know exactly where it's going uh, i'll you i'll program this from with probably just some random data that i know the, uh, the value and we'll check with uh, leds on the data line that it actually fetches those values um, but this is uh, this is how a computer would work uh, and then maybe after that maybe maybe we'll add a ram and see what we can do with RAM and uh, why not eventually build a small Z80 uh, computer that can actually work. Um, it, it, it's quite easy to build one, it just takes a bit of time and a bit of uh, patience, patience and tinkering, but it's it's not that hard. So guys, thank you for watching, um, I hope you're enjoying this series. Um, I'm gonna keep uh, working at this anyway, so <laughs> you better enjoy it. Uh, thanks to you for watching and I'll see you next time.